Greetings AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here. and We're going to be taking a look at our first video from a fairly new topic here that we're just beginning here with the CED. That's topic 5.7. And the name of the topic is second derivative test. And I know it can be kind of confusing because you've learned about this first derivative test and you've likely learned about this test for concavity then in creeps uh, this other test and we have to think about well what is it going to accomplish and and why do we need it in the first place so let's go ahead and take a look at this example and see if we can make a little bit of sense of it here is the beginning of our 5.7 notes and um, as we can see, uh, we, we're going to be looking at this idea of the second derivative test here. And it says we're going to investigate <clears throat> another way to find the maximum and minimum values of a function. And I really think that in and of itself, if I highlight this in this bright orange color, really hammers home the whole reasoning why we learn the second derivative test. Now, I'm hoping that after you read that, you kind of thought, well, wait a minute time out. Don't we already have a test that does a pretty good job of finding relative mins and maxes? And the answer to that is yes. The first derivative test, which I'm going to abbreviate FDT, does a pretty darn good job of finding minimum and maximum values. No denying that. But the second derivative test is just an alternate way to do it. In some cases, it might be easier. Hey, we're all about that, right? And then there are even other cases when we might be backed into a corner a little bit and we'd have no choice but to use the second derivative test. And we're going to see an example of that situation later on. So let's go ahead and take a look at and, and, uh, the box and see what the second derivative test is saying to us. It says that you've got a function f, and we know that the derivative of f at some value of c is equal to 0. And then we also know that the second derivative of, of that function will exist on some open interval that does contain that c. So you've got a couple of criteria there that have to be met. We have a two-part process here with this second derivative test. Number one, if the second derivative evaluated at that c that gave us the first derivative equal to zero is a greater than equal to zero situation, positive, then f of c is going to be the relative minimum. That's really weird for a couple of reasons. First of all, we're taking a critical value from the first derivative and we're plugging it into the second derivative. That's very unusual, very unusual thing for us to do. And then the second thing that sometimes students have issue with is the fact that this seems very counterintuitive. A positive result results in a minimum. A positive and a minimum, that doesn't seem to go together. But if you really think about this from the standpoint of concavity, it truly does make sense. For example, we know that the second derivative being positive would mean that we'd have a graph that might look something like this, concave up. Couple that with the fact that the first derivative is equal to zero at some point c, that means that you'd have maybe a tangent line that's horizontal, like right about there. Well, I don't know about you, but that point there certainly looks like a minimum to me. And when I say that point, the point that I've just highlighted there in, in the purple color. So it does make sense when you think about it in terms of the concavity issue. And of course, if the second step is going to read kind of uh, the, the other version, the second derivative being negative means that we're concave down. So that was what I meant by the other version of the concavity. Couple that with the fact that the first derivative is equal to zero at some point. That's probably going to be right there. And then lo and behold, you've got that purple point that's going to serve as a maximum. So you really don't have to set up any kind of a sign chart in the way of a number line when you're going to use the second derivative test. And that's what a lot of students tend to like about it. So let's take a look at our example here. We're asked to find the relative extrema for the function f of x equaling negative 3x to the fifth plus 5x to the third. And we do um, have to use the second derivative test here. Now, normally you could use either test, but for the purpose of this example, we're going to force us into using the second derivative. 
So the first thing that we're going to do is take the first derivative. And that would give us negative 15x to the fourth plus 15x to the second. Now we're actually going to stay here with this first derivative a little bit. We have to figure out where this first derivative is going to be equivalent to zero. So we're essentially finding like a, a group of critical numbers for this. So I can factor out negative 15 and how about an x squared? Let's factor out negative 15x squared and we have x squared minus one. So what we can do with this is uh, if, if you want to further factor, if you need to do that, you're welcome to. It's probably likely that uh, all of you watching can probably tell what the solutions are going to be. They're going to be three solutions, and they are x equaling 0 and 1 and negative 1 in really no particular order there. So what we're supposed to do is we are supposed to take each one of those three critical values and plug them into our second derivative. Now, we need to take that second derivative, so I'm going to do that over here in purple. So f double prime is going to be negative 60 x to the third plus 30 x. Now, you don't need to set that equal to zero or do any factoring with it or whatsoever. Just leave it as it is, and then we will just systematically go in one by one and plug in each of these first derivative values that were critical. So we can evaluate f double prime of 0, f double prime of 1, and f double prime of negative 1. So as we plug in 0, it's pretty clear you've got negative 60 times 0 cubed. You probably don't even need to write this out. You're going to get 0 for a result. Now I wanted to talk about this. If you look into the second derivative test definition, it doesn't make any mention of what happens if the second derivative is equal to zero. It doesn't say that it's a min, it doesn't say that it's a max. It technically is going to be considered inconclusive. That's how we're going to think about the second derivative equaling zero. Don't make any mention of min or max. It's very likely a point of inflection if the second derivative changes signs. You perhaps remember that from the last unit for the <coughs> sorry the last topic but <clears throat> as far as finding a min or a max we don't have to declare anything so you just move to the next value plugging in one in for the x will give you negative 60 times 1 cubed plus 30 times 1 which i believe is negative 60 plus 30 and that of course is negative 30 which no doubt is a negative number so you look at this and you can conclude from the second derivative test that you've got yourself a relative maximum. f of c is a relative maximum. And so we can go ahead and make that as part of our answer. So we'll say, um, um, I'm trying to think about the best way to describe this. It, it says find the relative extrema, which technically means it would be the y value. Um, so we could say, how about this? We'll say that there is a relative max um, that would be f of 1 in this case, right? <clears throat> and up here I'm going to do my work. f of 1 is technically negative 3 times 1 to the 5th plus 5 times 1 to the 3rd. That's negative 3 plus 5, everyone. So you have 2. So you have a relative max of 2. And you can say it occurs at x equal 1 if you want to add a little bit of flavor to it. Okay. Now, the reasoning is going to be because f prime of 1 is equal to 0 and f double prime of 1 is negative. Now, I'm writing this extra piece here kind of to, to uh, maybe go a little above and beyond, because really you wouldn't be required to write that statement, because it's pretty clear that that is indicated in this purple work. 
you're going to see an example uh, later on if you watch the video covering example two that is going to be a little bit more strict about using a, a justification like this. So I'd like to at least expose you to this extra bit of, of justification so that we have a, a thorough approach in the way that we're going to handle the problems that we're going to see in just a little bit. All right, we're just about done here because we're going to go ahead and plug in our negative one into our second derivative. So we have something that looks like this, negative 60 times negative 1 cubed plus 30 times negative 1. Here our negatives are going to end up canceling and we have positive 60 minus 30, which of course is 30, which of course is positive, which also means that we have ourselves a relative minimum. Right, A positive second derivative means a relative minimum value. What is that value? Well, that's a great question. So I might go up here where I've got a little room to work, and I'll plug negative 1 into the original function. It's going to look a little something like this. So I'm going to get positive 3 minus 5, which of course is negative 2. So the relative min is negative 2 and it's going to occur at x equal negative 1. Now if we want to put some rationale behind it, the reasoning is because the first derivative at negative 1 was equal to 0, and the second derivative of negative 1 turned out to be a positive result. Take a look at the graph. I have a graph actually all ready for you to, to take a peek at here to see if our findings are indeed um, correct. Move my camera out of the way here. And we do see that at negative 1, this point right here does reveal the location of a relative minimum. And that relative minimum has a value of negative 2. And lo and behold, at positive 1, there is a relative maximum that does hold the y value of positive 2. And as I said before, that value at 0 didn't turn out to be a min nor a max, uh, but it actually did turn out to be a point of inflection. The question didn't ask us to reveal that, so we don't have to say anything much further. So there you have it. This is your second derivative test. I hope you find it pretty easy. It's one of the uh, more enjoyable analysis that we do see of Unit 5, enjoyable in, in the way that it doesn't really take a whole lot of extra effort in most cases, and students tend to like it a little bit. Anyhow, we hope this helps. We thank you for joining, and we always look forward at the next video to seeing you again. Take care.